Okay, so we're on our second lesson. We're going to talk about the process of the evaluation. And I think this is fascinating because it tells me that, you know, you and I are going to be tested in a sense, right? I mean, if you were getting to, going to get an exam for school or college, wouldn't it be kind of cool if a month beforehand somebody gave you something that explained everything that's going to be on that test so you could prepare for it? Well, that's what the Bible does here for us. But most churches are ignoring this. They're not talking about this. But this is telling us we want to be the best we can when we stand before Christ. And it's kind of cool that we can see and learn this stuff. So before we start on rewards tonight, just remember that rewards are given to faithful Christians. First of all, you have to be a Christian, right? You have to be saved. And you get rewards for your service to God. So those who stay strong in their faith in spite of their pain, suffering, rejection, frustrations, different losses we go through, uh, no matter how small or great. And sometimes we look at some other Christian, we say, that person seems to everything go good for them, whereas I have all this pain and suffering in my life. Well, hey, don't worry about it, because God's keeping track and God knows. So we all go through pain and suffering and we wonder why. But you know what? The Bible says, just stay strong. Just keep persevering till the end, because God's going to bless you for this. And I think that's kind of... A wonderful thing and I think it'd be so cool if everybody could go through this and understand this first get a clear gospel and understand true what salvation is by faith in Christ and him alone but then understand as a Christian how you live your life matters it's important so that's why we believe in free grace like Romans 3 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption being bought back through Christ Jesus salvation is free it's a gift now that doesn't mean we can go out and live as we please there are those that are what's called hypergrace. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that, but hypergrace is a whole different theology that people believe. But those in hypergrace believe, hey, you get saved freely, but you can live as you please. God wants you to have fun. Well, that, that is not what my Bible tells me. My Bible tells me you get saved, you should live for Christ, you should live for God. And so there are some people out there that have some different weird views. That's why we try to go through the Bible verse by verse chapter by chapter, and try to understand for what it says, because it's extremely important not just to pick and choose, just to understand it. So um, you can turn to Romans chapter 14. Now, we are going to have the verses on the screen, but I'm going to talk about some other verses. So um, Romans 14, verse 10, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 are the two main verses that talk about the Bema Seat. They're the, really the only ones that use that word Bema Seat in the New Testament, but there's many verses that re allude to it. So we'll look at these here in just a minute. But the study of rewards can have a wonderful effect on your life. It really can. It can have an impact. And when I started learning this and studying this, it made me think about things about the future, the vertical versus my life here on this earth. That doesn't mean I don't drift back sometimes and, and don't act like a Christian like I should. Yes, I do drift back and I do act wrongly sometimes, but I catch myself and say, okay, this is not the way I should be. I should be doing what God wants me to do because I know that he wants me to, and I want to be a good testimony, but I know that he's going to judge me and that he's a faithful judge. So let me go ahead and read you this here on the screen. In the book, one of the books I'm using for this, it's called Going for the Gold, and it's by Joe L. Wall. And this is what he says about speaking of how the study rewards has affected his life as a Christian. And he wrote an excellent book on this. This book is very easy to understand and to go through and it's it's a very good book and as I mentioned last week there's two other books that I used also but I, I really like this book but it says here this is what he says this doctrine has had a profound impact on my life in a number of ways it has served and continues to serve as a purifying truth in my life over time this truth touched every area of my life where I should go to school what I should study what I should seek to accomplish in my life. I found myself sorting through my habits, my decisions, my activities, trying to see myself and my life just as Christ might when I stand before him on that great day. So that tells us we should think about this stuff, right? He says it had an effect on him, and I think that's the goal here, is we want to have this an effect on our lives. And then he goes on and says, Jesus can return at any moment. What we do and what we think in private will then be made public so the whole idea is you know a lot of times you have these christians are chameleon christians act like christians in church when they go out of the church they don't act like a christian at all and that's not the way we should be right we should always be the same way all the time because god knows what goes on in your mind 
and your private life also. Okay, so what we've learned so far, talking about last week, in the study of rewards, it is a positive motivation for godly living. Understanding that God's going to reward you or not reward you should motivate you to live for Him. Um, so this is what our pro thought process should be. Our thought process should be, God, you're keeping track of how I'm living my life, and I'm going to stand before you and answer for that and receive a gain or loss of rewards. And I think it motivates you, and God wants it to motivate us. He wants us to serve him out of the love for him. It's not what you and I necessarily, it's not like, hey, I'm going to do this for my own flesh and my own glory. No, you're doing it for his glory, and he will reward you for that. So that's the coolest thing about this. So last week we talked about these incentives, remember? First of all, as you know, salvation is free, right? Salvation you don't earn for. It's basically you believe that he died for you. Service is not free. It will cost you something. Discipleship for Christ is going to take something out of your life. You're going to have to do something. It means you're going to have to, you're going to have to do more than just you know, be saved. You're going to have to live your life as a Christian and be motivated because that's how you're going to be blessed. So number one, an incentive to godly priorities and decision, wise decision making. So knowing that God's going to, we're going to stand before God at the Bema seat, judgment seat, and give an account for our lives, and he's going to reward us it kind of tells us, what are my priorities in life? Do they relate to God? What is my decision-making that I make in my life, right? And number two, it's a motivation to a deeper spiritual life. It says, okay, I'm kind of tired. I don't think I should read my Bible today. But then you say, okay, if I was going to go do something fun, I would do it. And it's just the way, we should, motivation for a deeper spiritual life. It kind of motivates you. you should, that's stuff we should think about. And number three, it's a source of encouragement and comfort. To me, I, I seriously realize that I trust in God's promises because he promised this, and it comforts me to know that when I serve him, even though I may suffer persecution, things happen, somebody will come out and smash up our sign, $200 sign, and, and so on and so on, I realize that, hey, God promises he's going to take care of me, so I try to view my future through biblical eyes. I try to look at the future through what the Bible says, and not what my own physical life in this world says. So here's the thing. What are the steps I must take to get where I want to be as far as a Christian? Well, obviously, we need to humble ourselves. None of us have arrived yet, right? None of us are up here, are we? <laughs> At all, none of us. And I'll tell you, I'm not even in close. But it tells us we should always do our devotions, continue tithing and helping the church financially, be faithful in attendance, helping each other, doing things, caring about each other, and, and that's what we should do as a family, as a church. Share witness when you can, handle a track when you can, invite people. All this stuff we should do that we see in the Bible that what a disciple should do. And we need to get out of our comfort zones. That's the hardest thing. The comfort zone is, is comfortable, right? That's why they call it a comfort zone. But it's hard to get out of that and be uncomfortable. I know that is. And, but you know what? This is how we get blessed by doing this stuff. So tonight we talk about lesson two. It's the process of the evaluation. And as we go through this weeks by week by week, you're going to start seeing that all these puzzle pieces start getting put together. You're going to really um, have a better comprehension of this. But just as a reminder and a constant reminder, I always want to remind us that the Bible refers to two separate divine judgments. These are all future. Okay, first of all, at the cross when Christ died, he paid for your sins past present, and future, right? So all our sins were future at the time, right? He died 2,000 years ago. We weren't even born yet. But Christ died for your sins. And so your sins have been paid for on the cross. So you, if you placed your faith in Christ, you will never be judged for your sins. That doesn't mean that if you, don't live, that if you live a rebellious life right now that God doesn't discipline you in different ways. He does. He says you'll reap what you sow. And so we had to understand that. But you'll never stand before him and give account for your sins. Your sins have been taken care of. But you will stand and give an account for how you've lived for Christ. So these two uh, separate future divine judgments, one is for the unbeliever, the, the person that hasn't trusted Christ as Savior. They will be judged at what's called the great white throne judgment. And I mentioned this quite a bit when we, in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, it talks about the great white throne judgment where all unsaved will stand before for Christ and be judged for their sins. And they'll determine they'll all be cast into the lake of fire. It's not a pretty picture. It's very, you know, when you look at this, you kind of, it, it kind of bothers you, and it should. 
But the next one is for believers. If you know Christ as Savior, you will be judged at the Bema seat for their life of service or disservice. So gain of rewards or loss of rewards. And like I said, 2 Corinthians 5.10 is the main verse, but Romans 14.10 is another verse. So you're going to remember these verses when they're done. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Romans 14.10. And they're the two main verses that uses that word Bema seat, but other verses, as I said, allude, alludes to this very same judgment of we'll have before Christ. So we're secure in Christ. So we're saved for all eternity. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, there's no double jeopardy. In the United States Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, it says, the double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibits anyone from being prosecuted twice for substantially the same crime, okay? That's the, what's called the double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment. That's true also for the Bible. Here, Hebrews, the Bible says the same thing. Hebrews 7.27, who need not daily as those high priests, that's a, the high priest was a constant ongoing process of a sacrifice and animals back in the Old Testament before Christ came. So those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus doesn't have to do this over and over again daily. This Jesus did once when he offered up himself. Jesus went to the cross for your sins. According to Hebrews 7.27, he only has to do that once. He's not going to go to the cross again. He did it. He paid for it. All your sins, past, present, future. So that's Hebrews 7.27. There's another book, another verse in the book of Hebrews, and that's Hebrews 9.28. It says, so Christ was once offered. What does it say? So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Now that bear the sins of many is the Greek word palus, and palus is where we get our word P-O-L-Y, poly means many, multiple, okay? So Christ died for all sins. We know 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says he did not die just for the sins of those that are saved, but died for the sins of the whole world. I mean, he died for everybody. Whether you accept him or not, he died for your sins. And the, the most um, evil person in the world, he died for their sins. He paid for everybody's sins. He paid for Judas's sins. And everybody's sins he paid for. So then it says, To bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Do you realize that? When he comes back again, he's not going to look at you and say, Okay, you've been sinning. Because your sins have been paid for on the cross. He suffered. He paid for that. And so that's Hebrews 9.28. Then 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also has once suffered for sins. Christ also has once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. He was the just for the unjust, right? We are. We're the unjust. Well, we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The word quickened means made alive. He was made alive. Christ rose again from the grave. This is showing the sin payment was done. So, in Hebrews 7, 27, Hebrews 9, 28, and 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ died one time on the cross for our sins. It's a done deal. It's over. John 19.30 says what? When, he, when he's on the cross. Remember the seven sayings on the cross? John 19.30, Jesus said, it is finished, right? What, do you think he meant that? He meant it is finished. It wasn't like part done, you've got to do your part. No, it is finished. Your sins were paid for. We know that Romans 6.23 says wages or payment for sin is death. That's uh, eternally separated from God in the lake of fire. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is a gift. Now, last Sunday, I talked about that gift. Remember the woman at the well? And um, on YouTube, I can't remember how many people had watched this, but I had one comment on there, comment from a person in Ghana, uh, West Africa. It says, um, hey, they watched it, and it, I can't remember what they said, but they said they enjoyed it, and they loved watching you know, the sermon. So isn't that cool that our little old church can, all throughout the whole world, people watch can watch this and hear the clear gospel. And it's kind of cool to think there are churches and places out there that are given a clear gospel. And, and nowadays with the technology, you can reach anybody pretty much anywhere, right, that has a computer, go on YouTube. So I think that's kind of fascinating when you think about that. But this gift, a free gift, of this gift is a free gift of eternal life or salvation. So Romans 11.29. This is a good verse to remember. Okay, this is a really a good verse to remember. Those that say, well... I think you lose your salvation if you start living a bad life, or you start doing this and that. Romans 11, 29 says, For the gifts and calling, that's his invitation and gift. He, you know, he comes to the cross, he's there for everybody. Whoever looks upon me will be saved. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. 
That word repentance there is, uh, or the word without repentance is ahmetamelitos, uh, ahmetamelitos. Uh, and that w without is the word ah, and it's like putting a not before something or a no. So it's basically saying without repentance, without changing your mind. So the gifts and calling of God, he doesn't change his mind. That's what it's really saying. God gives you something, he doesn't, he doesn't change his mind. Um, this is going to sound kind of bad. I, it sounded somewhat racial, but this is when I was a kid growing up, where I went to school in northern Michigan, um, half of my school and city was basically Native American Indians, okay? It didn't matter. We, we grew up in like that, and my, actually my three neighbors were on all three sides were Native American Indians, and, and some of our best friends, and they were like brothers and sisters and so on. But we would play cowboys and Indians and stuff, and sometimes we'd take turns, but, but we were all like together. It didn't matter, but it was kind of funny because whenever we'd give somebody to somebody and ask for a back, we'd call them an Indian giver. <laughs> they would say the same thing, and it just sounds like horrible. I think of this today, and I think, boy, you wouldn't say this today. You'd get in big trouble for it, but God is not an Indian giver. You know, that sounds kind of ratio, doesn't it? But it's irrevocable. It means without repentance. It's irrevocable. He gives it to you. It's yours. It would never change his mind. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That gift of salvation he gives you, he's not going to take it back. That's the love of God. So that Romans 11.29 is a very good verse for us to remember. So at the judgment seat of Christ, here's the thing. At the judgment, at the bema seat of Christ, only Christians, those that are saved, will be present. If you're, if you're, if you're a Christian, you're obviously saved. If you're saved, you're a Christian. It's synonymous. will be present. Only saved people are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. Unsaved are going to be at that, um, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, the great white throne judgment. So there's two different things. Here's where we would be judged for what we've done for Christ. So as I mentioned, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we talked about last week. Let's talk a little bit about Romans chapter 14, verse 10. It's the other verse that uses that Bema seed in it. And the point here in this verse, and we'll look at this in just a second, is that we're all going to give an account of ourselves, of himself. So I'm going to give account for myself. So I don't need to worry um, that, what is Charlie doing? Why Charlie? This, no, I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to worry about what Carrie's doing. I need to worry about myself, right? Same for each and every one of us. We need to be concerned about ourselves. Not to be, because now as a pastor, truly, in a sense, you're responsible for teach God's word. So in a sense, I am responsible, and that's true. But we are brother keepers, and in a sense, we're responsible for that too. But you know what? When you stand before Christ, you're not going to be judged by how somebody else, what they did. You're going to be judged for yourself. So what does it say in Romans 14.10? It's basically three phases, three phrases. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you set at nothing your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So Romans 14, if you're there, the very first verse, the thing of Romans chapter 14 is talk about our relationship with each other. That's what the whole chapter is about. Your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why it says in verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. In other words, the things are sinful. But basically, we there's weak, when somebody comes in here and they first get saved, they, maybe they came out of something bad and, it takes a while to grow, doesn't it? When you and I first got saved, we weren't mature Christians. I mean, we may not be mature Christians at this point either, but you know what? You grow. It takes time. So we, when you, some young Christian comes in, we've got to be careful about judging them because remember that day when we were there? And so that's what Romans 14, a lot of it is talking about. And that's why verse 4 it says, Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yeah, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. So the point is, God's going to judge each and every one of us. We don't have to worry about that ourselves. God's going to judge each one of us. That's Romans chapter 14, verse 1, then verse 4. But then in verse 7 it says, of Romans 14, For none of us liveth in himself, and no man dieth to himself. Now we all have an effect on each other, right? So as you live... Other people are watching you, and as I live, people are watching me, and so on and so on. So we got to be careful about how we live because it could have a negative effect on somebody. But you know what? You're going to be judged for how you live. And that's why in verse 10 it says, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you set at nothing in your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Then in verse 12, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 
verse uh, 13, let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. So in other words, in verse 13 there, how you live, if your brother's watching you, and they say, well, I know that person's a Christian, and they've been a Christian a long time, and they're doing this stuff, so it must be okay to do this. So you've got to understand that people are watching us. Little kids come into church and so on. They're, they're kind of looking at us, right? So we've got to be careful how we act. That's, that's kind of what it's getting at in our relationship to each other. But the point here is, in Revelation, Romans chapter 14, verse 10, why do you judge your brother? That's a fellow believer. Um, and verse 12 tells us it's each and every one of us that need to worry about ju judging. If we judge our brother, it's kind of being hip like a hypocrisy, right? Because many times we will judge somebody for something and then we'll go out and do the same thing. But we, we like to judge. And we like to judge people for the way they dress, for things they say, how they're raising their children. Everybody likes to do this. But you know what? We don't always understand people's motives, do we? We don't understand where they're coming from. You know, sometimes you got to realize that these people didn't have, have the upbringing that you have. And so we got to be careful with how we judge these people. Now, when I say judging, we're not talking about doctrine and we're not talking about sin. Okay, obviously, if a person's living in sin, you need to say something to them in a nice, kind way. Yeah, doctrinal things... You need to stand for truth on the doctrine, okay? So that's, it's not talking about that. It's talking about somebody that's a Christian that's doing something than you. You shouldn't worry about judging them for how they live or what they think is right or wrong because you need to worry about your own self. Because it says here, for why do we set at nothing? That word nothing there means contempt, your brother. Why do we look down on our brother and try to make ourselves appear like we're here and they're here? And Christians do that, right? They always do. Uh, for we shall all stand... We will all stand. Look at Romans 14, 10, the third uh, phase, the third uh, sentence there. For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ sits on the throne. He will judge us. We will stand. Okay? Jesus is a judge. We're going to talk about this title or idea of judge here when we get to slide number seven. And we'll see that. Yes, we need to judge doctrine. We need to judge sin. But we can't judge motives. We don't know somebody's motives. We don't know what's going on in their life. Our judgment, and truly when we do judge and we do talk to people, we should have that positive influence to try to help them, bring them around, correct them. Younger Christians, we should try to be a positive influence to them. So here, let's go ahead and move on and talk about this Bema. Now we looked at this a little bit last week, but this is what it says in the Greek lexicon, which is called the Blue Letter Bible. It refers to the Bema as a step, a pace, the space which a foot covers, a foot breath, a raised place mounted by steps, a platform, a tribune, of the official seat of a judge, of the judgment seat of Christ. Herod built a structure resembling a throne at Caesarea from which he viewed the games and made speeches to the people. So basically, Bema seat just means a place you sit and you judge, okay? When Jesus came before Pilate, Pilate was on a Bema seat judging him. Um, other places in the Bible, it talks about judgment taking place. So this is... A, not just a spiritual thing, although the application is spiritual here, but this is also something that was judged at the different types of games, okay? That, was, that took place then, that you judge the people for who's a winner, who's a loser, and then receive the reward. So that's what it means by beam or judgment. See, it just means to, to judge. Okay, so here's something that Chuck Missler said, and I thought this was pretty interesting. And Chuck Mister, Missler, the uh, pastor that he's passed away now, but... I think in 2016, maybe, something like that. But on his, he has a ministry, and he called it Koinonia Coin, uh, House. And it, this is under the title of Final Exam. He has a very good timeline in this. And next week, when we're talking about the timeline, this whole idea of the Bema seat, we're going to see that. And it will kind of, that picture in your mind, it will make it clearer. But here's what, here's what Chuck Missler says. This judgment is often taught as simply an award ceremony. But that is not entirely correct. It was the tribunal seat, the judicial bench, the judgment seat, or throne of the one in charge. Herod Grippa I addressed the people of Tyre and Sidon from the Bema seat. Jesus was brought before Pilate and his Bema seat. Paul was accused before proconsul Galileo and brought before Festus at Caesarea facing a Bema seat. So Bema seat is something that is just was common in them days. It's just a place of judgment. In fact, in Corinth, they found a ruin of one of these Bema seats, okay, as a she at the bottom of the screen there. So, but Paul compares this idea of a Bema seat 
for the Christian's life that we're all going to stand before this Bema seat for Christ. And he talks about it's like a track meet. It's like a boxing match. Now, I remember in high school I used to run a half mile and I hated it. I didn't, track was like the most boring sport there is. I don't know if there is a bo more boring sport, but I, I just didn't like it. But anyways, you know, Paul calls it a track meet. And he doesn't call it like a, it's not like a 100-yard dash or a sprint or anything like that, 40-yard dash. It's, an, it's a marathon. Our Christian life's a marathon. We just keep going. We just keep going. We go at our own speeds, and it's like a boxing match. You know, you stand there, and you continually fight. So our preparation for this judgment of your life of service, that's what the Bema Seed is. We're preparing for this future, standing before Christ. It's not supposed to be easy. It's really not, okay? I mean, you know if you're preparing for a boxing match, and you're going to get in the ring with somebody that was a boxer, I mean, you'd train pretty hard, because otherwise you'd get beat up pretty good. Well, it's not supposed to be easy. Uh, same with running a, a, a track, a, a race. It's not going to be easy. It takes a lot of training and, and endurance and pushing yourself. But the Christian life should be the similar the same way, and that's why Paul compares it to that. Ironically, other churches, I mean, they teach about your best life now, be all you can be, and, and so on and so on, and they don't talk about how that if you live godly lives in Christ Jesus, you'll suffer persecution. They don't talk about that because not people. People don't want to go to church to hear that the Bible says you're going to be, you're going to have these problems, you're going to lose your friends, and so on and so on. They don't want to hear that, but that's what the Bible says. And so there's very few churches that will cover this stuff about the true Christian life. You look at what Paul. I think it's Second Corinthians chapter 11, where it talks about everything that Paul went through. It was pretty bad. He was beat up. He was shipwrecked. He was so on and so on. Not a pretty picture, but. I'm not trying to say that we look forward to going through this type of life of judgment or persecution, anything like that. But hey, realize the Christian life is not supposed to be, you know, something where it's comfortable and easy all the time. Sometimes you've got to push yourself a little bit and, and work for Christ because that's how he's going to reward you. In one of the examples of this uh, judgment, uh, be my seat, is here what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 24 and 27, he says, No, you not. In other words, don't you know that they which run in a race, they're all running, they all run, run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain or win. Paul's saying, hey, we're all running in this race. We're all living for Christ. It's an endurance. It's a marathon. Push yourself and try to be the best that you can. Okay, only one person wins a race. Be all that you can be for Jesus. I mean, a lot of sermons are be that all you can be for yourself. The Bible, be all you can be for Jesus. And then it says, every man that strives, that word strives is actually where you get our word agony, okay? Every man that goes through agony or strives for the mastery, in other words, to be the best they can be, is temperate. Temperate refers to self-control. You control yourself in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. What's a corruptible crown? It's a crown that rots, it rusts, it burns, it's forgotten. It's gone. But we are an incorruptible crown. It's the same word, corruptible and incorruptible. The only difference is incorruptible has the Greek letter alpha in front of it, the A, and that means incorruptible, not corruptible. So the incorruptible crown, we're going to talk about that when I think it's week 13 about this. So we'll see this a little more in depth when we get there. But the incorruptible crown is immortal. It lasts forever. So strive for that crown. And then he goes on in verse 26, he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, in other words, he's focused, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. In other words, he doesn't just box in, box in the air. Um, he, he doesn't waste his time. He's, going through, he's not just going through the motions. He realizes there's something important here that I need to do, and so I'm going to do it with the best of my ability for Christ. In the last uh, verse there, verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. You know what that word subjection, if you look it up in a, a Greek lexicon or a Greek dictionary, what it actually means, you make your body into a slave. Body, I don't care how you feel. You're going to do this. Okay? It's like you get up in the morning, okay, I was going to exercise this morning. I don't feel like it. No, you're going to do it anyways. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes, isn't it? But that's what that means. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, unless that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know being a castaway doesn't mean lost in the lake of fire. You know that, right? Castaway means basically he gave up, he didn't finish, he's not going to get any rewards. And a lot of Christians do that. I know quite a few Christians 
that went to Bible college with me or, or, or and so on and so on are basically have doing nothing for Christ at all anymore. They just basically are sitting on the shelf. They become what you'd call a castaway. We don't want to do that. We want to persevere. We want to keep going because it is going to be important what you receive for Christ. Deny yourself, put, give, make him first in your life, and live for him. And that's what Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 through 27. Now here, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Paul says this, I have fought a good fight. This is right before his death. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Finished, that word finished is where we get the word telescope from. Actually, telescope means he's looking toward the future. He's finished. He's at the end of his life. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Kept the faith. It doesn't mean that he didn't stop believing. The faith there, that word the, is a definite article. It's the word ha in the Greek, and faith is pistis, ha pistis. It means the faith. It means What does it mean? It means body of truth. It means I stayed believing what God gave me to believe. And that's what you and I need to do. We need to keep the faith. The faith. The body of truth. What is taught in this Bible? Stay strong. And that's what Paul is saying he did. He kept the faith. He kept the truth. He stayed strong. Then in verse 8 he says, henceforth. Now we don't use henceforth so much anymore, do we? We would say, so, we'd say, so there is laid up for me. But old English, henceforth there is laid up for me. It's like at Christmas time when you put stuff on layaway, right? It is laid up for me a crown. That crown is the Stephanos. It's a wreath. That, and it says here the crown of righteousness. Now that's one of the crowns we're going to talk about too later on in more detail. Laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge. And we're going to talk about Jesus being as the judge soon. And, but the Lord, the righteous judge. He's a good judge. He's, he's not like, um, you know, sometimes if you watch football, the guy, the ref makes a mistake and he calls a penalty or doesn't call a penalty. No, no judge or ref is perfect, are they? Even in a court of law, it's not perfect. But Jesus is a righteous judge. And it says here, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. What is that day? That's the day of the Bema Seat. That's when we stand before him. And not to me only, get this part, not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. That is telling me right here that this crown of righteousness is going to be given to anybody that loves his appearance. It keeps their eyes on Christ. There lives their life on the vertical plane versus the horizontal. That's what that is telling me. You're living for Christ. You keep the faith, the body of truth. And look for his coming back because you know that's what's important. You love his appearing. You could receive that crown of righteousness. I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, it's given to a lot of people. So he is the righteous judge. So let's talk about um, God, Jesus, being the righteous judge here next. John 5, 27. It says here, he and has given him authority, God, has give, God the Father has given Jesus authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So who's going to be the judge? The judge is going to be Jesus Christ. John 5, 27, he's given that authority. He's going to execute judgment. Son of Man. How does he know how to judge us? Well, he came and lived as a man. He knows the same things we go through. He, he knows the same temptations, trials, and so on that you and I go through. So he's going to be the perfect judge, right? And that's what's kind of cool, because he is the Son of Man. He lived as a man. He was God in human flesh. He understands what we went through. So he's going to be the judge. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who judge the quick and the dead, that's the living and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom. So Jesus Christ is not only going to judge you and I at the Bema Seat, he's also going to be the judge at the great right throne throne judgment revelation chapter 20 jesus is going to be this judge he's the righteous judge so he's going to be the judge that we're going to stand before but there's a process now first corinthians 3 verse 11 through 15 we're going to look at that here in just a second and specifically this refers to church related ministry and so on what we do in our churches but it says here in verse 11 for other foundation so first and foremost you need to have that foundation we talked about that last week right uh, the foundation is Christ. For if for other foundation can no man lay, then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as Savior, first thing is you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, meaning you believe that he actually died on the cross for your sins. Then it says in verse 12 and 13, Now if any man build upon this foundation, in other words, your works, your fruits, gold, silver, precious stones, that's good fruit, that's good works, right? Gold, silver, precious stones. That's all the good stuff you do. 
Uh, wood, hay, stubble, that's the rotten fruit. That's the bad things you do, okay? They burn up. They're no good. Then verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. The day is that Bemis, the Bemis seat when you stand before Christ shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, I don't know literally if this is going to be an actual fire or what it is. But as you know, fire purifies uh, gold, silver, precious stones, and so on. But if it's wood, it's double, it just burns up and goes up in smoke. It's wasted. So basically, these are metaphors um, for the things we do in our life and how we live our life, if they're going to mount or they're not going to mount for Christ. So it'll purify us. Burned away, it's a figure of speech, it's a metaphor, as I mentioned. So actuality, what's being determined? You serve Christ or you serve self. So if you just serve self, you're probably going to only have wood, hay, and stubble. If you serve Christ, depending on how good you were at it, you gold, silver, precious stones, right? So it would be good to get all gold, wouldn't it? Okay, so, but, you know, that's what we strive for. So learning and understanding the Bible and learning this stuff is important, but application is importanter, okay? How do you like my English? Importanter, or more important, right? So when we learn stuff, we learn to apply it in our lives and actually put it to use. And that is how God's going to judge us. What have you done with what you learned? It's important to learn. It's important to understand stuff because you need, we need to know that. But then what are, how are we going to use that in our lives? So in verse 14 and 15 of 1 Corinthians here, it says, going on, it says, If any man's work abide, that's your fruit or your works, if any man's work abides which he has built thereon, he shall receive a reward. That's pretty straightforward, right? If what you've done was good, you will receive a reward. Now, God's going to be the, or Jesus Christ is going to be the judge of this. You and I may think, well, I'm not doing much. I haven't done this. I haven't done that, or whatever. And there, there's, I'm sure there's some people that think that, hey, they've done everything. And they're going to be the greatest in heaven. Well, then, first of all, they need to be a little more humble, don't they? But anyway, if any man's work abides, remains, which he has built there, and he shall receive a reward. Then verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. He shall suffer loss, but he shall be saved, yet so as by fire. In other words, at the beam of seat of Christ, you may stand there and have nothing to show. It may be burned all away, but you're there, and you're going to be in heaven for all eternity. You're saved. That's, that you don't have to worry about. Uh, you can maybe, in a sense, metaphorically, you'll be naked before Jesus Christ with tears in your eyes of regret. And that's, that's the sad reality of this. But you could suffer loss. And so this is motivation to live for Christ. And I, I look at this and I, I think, you know, God's telling me this and I realize this. This is how I should live. And it's extremely important. In fact, here's a very, very important consideration. I'm going to ask two questions here. And these are somewhat convicting. Are you a man pleaser and only doing what can be seen by your fellow brothers and sisters? We know people like that, right? When the boss walks in, they're a whole different person, right? <laughs> We've seen that before. But when the boss isn't there, you know, there they can be the awfulest person you ever met. But in our Christian life, are we just doing stuff to be a man pleaser and only doing what can be seen by your fellow brothers and sisters? You know, the, the rewards you get there, is that's the only reward you're going to get if you're just doing it because you're being seen. But number two, is your motive to please Christ? Therefore, many things you do are unseen, and yet done for God's glory. That should be our motive. It isn't that we're looking for anything right now, are we? Roar words right now, because we're looking for the future. God's going to be the judge. It's not your fellow mankind. Our motives are to please Christ, not to be a man pleaser. So here's something to think about. In your mind, think about these two options, then answer them as honestly as you can before God in the silence of your mind. Take your time and think this through. Do we want to be a man pleaser or do we want to please Christ? These two options. Something we should think about throughout the week, the months to come, and always. Am I doing this for Christ? Am I doing this just for myself? And that's important because that's a very important consideration to think through. So it's let's let's think about this as we go forward after tonight. You know, what is my motivation? I consider, am I doing things? Out of fear of man, or do I want the praise of man, or am I doing things because out of respect of Christ, and I want to stand before Christ 
and be rewarded because I've served him with everything I have. So that's pretty, that's, that's a convicting question, isn't it? I mean, it really is. <laughs> I look at that. But let's go ahead and look at um, a summary of Paul here, what he says. And Paul describes the Bema Seat in three steps. First, he says this. Our lives will be made manifest. All that we've done as a Christian is revealed. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes you think, well, I've wasted all my life. But you know what? You can start right now, and you can do the best you can, for the, even if we're in the eighth inning, ninth inning, whatever. It's, we, we always, that's the thing is you can always get up and wipe your feet off, and if you fall down, get back up again. God sees that. He just wants us to keep getting up if we get knocked down. So then step two. Christ would determine the value or worth of what we have done. He is the one that's going to determine if it was valuable or it wasn't valuable. So that's, that's what we have to understand. He's going to determine the worth, worthiness of what we did. So he's the perfect, righteous judge. Step three, you will receive rewards or no rewards. You're in between. You know, we're all going to be received. In either case, you are saved for all eternity. I hope everybody understands that, right? You're, you're saved for all eternity as we see. So you're still going to be in heaven there's going to be a lot we're going to talk about here in the future about some of this, and some of this is going to kind of blow you away. But these rewards, I'm just going to give you what some of this is. A public co commendation. Jesus will say to you, um, well done, good and faithful servant. Could you imagine that, with Christ saying that to you? Uh, wreath. Wreath is that Stephanos. It's that crown that will be placed in your head. Uh, you'll give an appointment to rule in the kingdom. We know in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, it talks about being kings and priests. God's going to Evaluate your life and decide how you're going to be in the kingdom for him, your position. And number four, the location in the thousand-year millennial kingdom. This is something that people don't understand. And that's something they got to understand. In the millennial kingdom, and we're going to talk about more of this later. We'll go into this in more detail. But those that serve Christ and give him everything are going to be closer to Christ, more like the closer inner circle of the family. Those that don't serve Christ will still be there but they're not going to be in the closeness of Christ in the kingdom. So it's, it's kind of, you think about that, it kind of thinks, you know, I, I kind of want to be close to Christ and I want to be there. So here's the thing. Um, we'll explain this in a future lesson. Now I've got some references here. Uh, sometimes it might be good to go back and review these and write down more notes. And we'll, we're going to go over these verses in the future. But Luke 12, verse 2 through 3, says that nothing will be hidden. So if you think you can go in your closet and turn the light off and crop, God won't see you, nothing's going to be hidden. And then uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, it says, As you confess Christ before your fellow man, Christ is going to confess you before the Father. That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about, hey, Jesus Christ, maybe it's like putting his arm around you and say, Father, this guy served me his whole life. You know, I'm going to confess him before you. And that's kind of what... Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 8 and 9 is talking about. In Luke chapter 19, verse 17 through 26, it talks about them 10 pounds, you know. One per, like, maybe Chris was given 10 pounds, Carrie's given 8 pounds, Tony's given 6 pounds, Charlie given 4 pounds, so on and so on. Basically given different skills. We all have different skills, right, and abilities. And so if the, the skills and abilities, depending on what you have, if it's a lot or a little, depending on how you manifest that and live your life, you know, is how God's going to bless you. So you may say, oh, I don't have all the skills and abilities like this person that can get up and sing in such a wonderful voice, or this orator can get up and teach God's words so, so smart and he knows this and that, or this person's got such a wonderful personality. You know what? Take what you have and do it to the best of your ability for God. He's the one that's going to judge you for that. So whether a lot or a little, do the best you can. He's going to determine it because we're all different. So then in Matthew there, I've got Matthew 25, 21. If you're, if you're faithful, whether you're in a little or a lot, just do the best you can, whatever you have. 2 Peter 1, verse 11 is very interesting. If you bear fruit, your entrance into the kingdom will be great. That's what it said, says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. So you'd say, okay, fruit's a metaphor. It's, just, it's not talking about apples and oranges and bananas. It's talking about the things you do in your life. If you ever get a chance, look up what fruits actually are. Fruit is... Um, is you and I, how we live our life and how we show it outwardly. In verse 1 through 10 of First Peter chapter, or Second Peter chapter 1, especially verse 5 through 7, it says that 
we all have faith. It's talking to Christians. But he's, here's the things you need to add to that faith. These fruits. Purity. Knowledge. Self-control. Patience. Endurance. Godliness. Kindness. Love. These are all things that you and I have to add to our faith, right? When you first get saved, you're not super Christian, are you? No, it, it's a growing process. You need to go back and learn and say, okay, I, I need to live a pure life. I need more knowledge. I need to study more. I need self-control. I need patience. And I'll tell you what, I need a lot of patience. <laughs> if, when I'm driving, I need a lot of patience. Um, endurance, godliness, kindness, love. We all need more of that. But that's stuff we need to work on. These are fruits that you need to water your tree for that fruit to grow. You need to abide in Christ. It doesn't just happen automatically. Now, it is true. When a person first gets saved, I think they're full of, full of joy. They're excited. They'll go out and tell somebody. So every single Christian is going to have some fruits but if you go to a bad church, or you don't go to church at all, or you get mixed up with the wrong crowd, you become bitter, whatever, whatever, you're not going to have much fruit, are you? Fruit requires you to decide, I need to serve Christ, I need to abide in Christ, I need to stay close to Him, and I need to do obedience to Him. And that's how you bear fruit in your life. So let's look at this just a little bit more, and we'll be done here in just a minute. Okay, the issue of works and fruits. Colossians 2.6 says, Have you therefore received Christ? First step. Receive Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God. The Lord shall walk in him. So walk in him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, that we're foreordained that we should walk in them. So abide, walk means to serve, do stuff by faith. So you're saved, now you serve. You're saved, now you do discipleship. John 15, 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, that's obedience, allowing God's word and his Holy Spirit to work in you. And I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. So how do you bring forth much fruit? By abiding in Christ, by being obedient. For without me, you can do nothing. So works of the flesh, outward show that we do, it doesn't amount to much. It's really what you're doing from true inner you for Christ. Uh, there was a guy that called me up before we came to our church. This was back in the hotel. And he was a uh, Calvinist. And in other words, Calvinists believe that God chooses this person to be saved, that person not to be saved. And I says, well, I believe that everybody's free will could be saved if they just trust Christ as Savior. He says, what do you do with John 15, 5? And he's trying to say that that teaches you that you have to, that God chooses each person, and he doesn't. And I, I mentioned to him, well, in verse 8 of John chapter 15, it says this is discipleship. This is all about being a disciple. It's about serving. So John chapter 15 in your Bibles, underline verse 8 or circle it. Because it says, it's talking about discipleship. That's what the fruit and the vine is all about. Discipleship. Living for him. And so on. So let's go close with one more verse here. Or a couple more verses. And this is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has tricked you? That you should not obey the truth. You need to obey the truth. Make that decision. Obey. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had evidently been set forth, crucified among you. Everybody saw it. This only what I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He be therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So the truth is, we we try to manifest stuff ourselves in our own flesh, but we need to do it by walking by faith, by obedience, being God's word. That's the whole point here. In Galatians, I got uh, chapter 5, verse 1 through 26 in there. That talks more practical results of abiding in Christ uh, and the fruits. It's not legalism. In other words, there's plenty of people that, you know, go to church and they're all dressed up and this and that, and they look good outwardly, but truly God looks at our heart, doesn't he? So obedience to God's word and the Holy Spirit is really the key. And staying close to him and following him and living for him in the long run, like a marathon, is how you are going to receive the best that you can for Christ when you stand before him at the Bema Seat. So that's what I have here. Next week we're going to talk a little bit more about this timing, when this happens, and how it works out. So each week you add a little bit to this puzzle and, and it'll come together and it'll be pretty cool. So let's go ahead and open up for prayer now.